What's up, everybody? It's Ivan with Trout Splashing, back with Five Flies for December. Happy to welcome Tanner Smith and Scott Dixon back to the program. Head guide, man in the shop, both men of the water. Glad to be here. Yeah, so. stoked, stoked to be here. This is, <laughs> just so you guys know, we were sitting here for about five minutes, recording with no sound, so. Yeah, this is, this is a better start. We're recording. Here, here we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so December, obviously it's, it's cold. It's no longer fall. We're getting into like the, we're getting into the meat of winter. You know, we get the beginning of winter, like in December, January really stinks. I mean, it's great. Uh, February, you have like March on the horizon, but December, you've got the long, it's a long runway of winter, right? And there's, a, you know, obviously things that we'll miss about fall fishing, but there's a lot of things that like about winter fishing scott you're usually busy you know through through the fall with the guide season what do you like about winter fishing for the most part well the main thing i like about winter fishing is i get a chance to get out on the water um i love getting out there during the winter months i tend to pick and choose the days that i go out where i try to hit those days where it's going to be a little bit warmer but getting out on the water not having the crowds not having nearly as many people out there um fishing is definitely tougher during the winter months but fish got to eat so Mm -hmm. It's true. Still going out there trying to catch them, and uh, sometimes you got to hit them on the face to get them to eat, but uh, they still do. And it's it's always nice when you can get out there those bluebird days during the winter months and uh, get a few fish in the net. Yeah, if you were to choose a winter day, like build your perfect winter day in terms of like temperature, cloud cover. Can we get a little like uh, moon cycle too? Uh, <laughs> No, not the moon cycle, but I like days that are sunny. I know people talk about, oh, those cloud cover days are great. I like the sunny days because I like being able to see the fish. And during the wintertime, you get lots of opportunities to sight fish while you're out on the water. Um, If it's going to be temperatures up in the 40s, that means usually in the morning it's going to start out in the 20s. But you just layer up, bring your gloves, bring your hand warmers, and uh, get out there and fish. And by the time it starts cooling down, that's usually about the time I'm starting to peel off the water head back home so for sure uh, a lot of times those winter days are a little bit shorter but uh, it gets me out on the water and still get a chance to, to fish so yeah. i'm a big fan of them nice tanner noted uh send big big time send guy in the middle of winter yeah yes you like <laughs> you like to you like to head places go go see some stuff uh what do you like about winter sense same thing scott was saying i mean just Getting away from people is always the name of the game, especially as the sport grows in popularity. Uh, so take advantage of that. I mean, don't be scared of elements. You know, you are going to be cold. Accept yeah. the fact that you're going to be cold and, you know, layer up, bring hot hands, bring all that stuff. And fish will still be active. A great perk of the winter days, yes, like fishing time might be shorter, but you can, you know, you're like where in the summer you're fishing, you're like, oh, I'm going to fish till sundown. Suddenly it's 10 o'clock and you're like, damn, I'm not going to be home until like 2 a.m. Right. You know, winter, you don't have that problem. You're like, oh, it's dark as hell. It's like, oh, it's 4.15. Right. Cool. You know, like, I'm going to catch dinner. This is like, we're rolling right now. Right. So uh, that's, I mean, that's a big advantage as well. But yeah, I mean, less people, fish still eat, all those good things. You know, the experience, you're still out there. You know, you feel you feel good when you're fishing in the winter you're and catching stuff. fish. You're seeing stuff, you know, right. stuff that you don't see in the summer. Right. Like snow. And, and like when the, when flows are low, you get to see a lot of those features. Uh, you can sort of bank on those uh, when you get into the like, higher water season, right? So like, you can sort of predict where you might see fish in the spring, the fall, the, the summertime when those flows are higher. So it's also a good like, sc- practice of scouting, you know, getting yourself more familiar with the substrate. Sort of thing. That's like a pretty deep answer, but like, I mean, you're absolutely correct. If you're spending time, I'm sure like Deckers, you know, Deckers in and out, you know, but. Still learn new stuff up there. Yeah. Still find new little pockets that. Yeah. Uh, during the low flows that the river changes yeah. and you'll uh, a lot of times in higher flows you'll walk by one thing and then during the low flows during the winter you'll be like oh that's kind of a nice little yeah. bucket right there I'm going to hit that and a lot of times they produce so. Here, here's something that people don't want to talk about you can run into fishless days in the middle of the summer too right like fishing can be hard any time of the year right it's like fishing you can just run into a bad day any time of the year and so like Winter time, yes, it's the conditions aren't as comfortable, but you can still have really good days. You can have some days that aren't as good, but you don't know. Right, and that's way Unless easier to blame the elements in the winter time. Right. Like when you're struggling and fishing is hard in the summertime, like it's probably 
you more than anything, which is <laughs> hard for most of us to accept. Look, <laughs> you know, you're like, man, you know, I winter, stink. Winter time, it's like cold. You're like, oh, the fish weren't eating. You know, right. like yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, this this sucked. It Certainly not this, my fault. Yeah, come on. <laughs> right. I didn't have the any sm- small midges in my box. Like they weren't eating a 16 pheasant tail. Like not my problem. Right. You know, <laughs> right. Like, so. Perfect. That's right. perfect. Right. It's very true. Cool. So we're going to get into it, talk about uh, five flies to get you through uh, the month of December, but then also we'll talk uh, on uh, answer some of your questions that you asked in the last episode. Again, if you have any questions about January, uh, drop them in, drop a comment down below. Rigging, bug choice, presentation. Um, if you want to talk moon, moon cycles, I'm not your guy, but you know if you wanted to put that in there, by all means. So uh, let's get to it. Let's talk flies. I mean, uh, that that feels like a test. Feels like throw them down the yeah. throw them down the comments. Let's get some moon cycle talk going in January. Let's go. Let's fire it. <laughs> it's never easy doing stuff with you, Yvonne, is it? No, no. I mean, look, there's like 13 different things I got to make sure I press and record. Can we on. give the audience like a feel for like how many times you just like don't press record, don't bring a memory card, like forget your camera batteries, like. Crash the drone, like this. This happens every time. It's like Did you want to get a feel for it. <laughs> Adds excitement uh, to it. It's, you, know? you know. Let me just say, I I leave a shotgun microphone in my car because I know I will probably forget my shotgun microphone at home. I can't leave my batteries in my car, but like, if I could, if they would remain charged in the middle of winter, I would leave like three extra batteries in the car because there's a solid chance I'm going to leave something at home. There's a lot of stuff, man. I'm not like the most organized person. So for me to have to press record on one, two, three, four things and have the settings right, that's a big accomplishment. So, like, shout out to me for, for overcoming the odds. Oh, my God. We're going well to done. Sh- shoot a video today. Tanner, I didn't – I don't have the camera. I've never done that. I've never done that. I have shown up without with every lens. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. But What's the plan, the, you know? <laughs> I'll just do something on my phone maybe. Yeah. Know? Cool. Didn't cool. work. That didn't work out. That didn't work out. I forgot. I forgot the. I forgot the batteries. It's not a great look. I had a full camera. I, I had everything I needed except for batteries. It was bad. Yeah. All right. Fly number one is uh, Charlie Craven's two bit midge in red. Uh, it is obviously midge season. Uh, this fly gets down. What do you like about uh, the two bit midge, Scott? Uh, exactly what you said. The bug gets down. Uh, a lot of times you're trying to avoid the, the splash from that added split shot. You want it to get down to the bottom to where the fish are because this time of year, a lot of the fish are glued right to the bottom. And that as a mid fly or your trailing fly, a lot of times if you're doing a three fly rig, that'll help get it down to the bottom right into the feeding windows of a fish. And yeah, it's a great bug. A lot of times uh, today we were talking about it in red, but I mean, switching up colors on it. All of black, different things like that. Um, it does the job. What time of year do you like to use red? During the winter months. I'm yeah. a big fan of red during the winter months. And uh, going with small midges, it works out. Yeah, it's hard to beat. Tanner, noted Charlie Craven fan. Maybe one time he'll come on this podcast. Yes. <laughs> one time, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, what do you like about the two bit midge? Um, yeah, like Scott touched base on, I mean, weight that a fish could eat is a crazy advantage. You know, it's, uh, if you can eliminate that split shot bloop, like with picky fish and like your cheese mechanics or deckers, all those places, you have natural weight that gets down, drifts well, and something could eat it. That seems like, like a success to me. So yeah, great pattern. Yeah. Nice. Cool. There it is. Fly number one, two bit Mitch. Fly number two is a zebra midge in black with silver wire and a silver bead. This is like, this is the most classic of all classics, right? Uh, doesn't have as much weight as the two bit midge, uh, but certainly gets down. Uh, a good addition to a, a three fly rig. Tanner, talk to me about the zebra midge. Tell me your secrets. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's a classic. So many people nowadays with, you know, you come to a fly shop, there's 55 bins full of midges, and like you want to pick this electric pink crazy midge and it's like midges are going to be probably olive black or red you know maybe some clear in the water so zebra midge has to be in your box it's going to catch you fish it's 
something I have on my fly or like if I'm nymphing like that is I'm in the winter, like that will be on my rig a hundred percent of the time unless fish are eating dry flies. It's like old reliable, you know? So it really is. I mean, and you can pick a zebra midge in pretty much whatever size you want from like size 22 up to size 14. They all catch fish. Um, during the winter months, you're finding more of those smaller midges. So using one of the tiny ones with the smaller bead on it still helps it get down. Um, and yeah, fish are kind of keen in on midges this time of year because you're not finding PMDs. You're not finding the caddis out there flying around. It's cold. Yeah. I mean, you're finding a lot of midges and uh, having a box with a bunch of different type of midges, a bunch of different sizes, a bunch of different colors uh, does the job. But the zebra midge in black is just the, the classic... Uh, yeah. Um, midge bug that works well. I would add uh, a bunch of different weights to that as well, right? So like size, color, weight. Yep. Uh, you know, weight will get will help you present in a variety of water columns. Like if you're seeing fish glued to the bottom, put a beat. You know, put a heavier fly on. If you're seeing them sort of elevated, maybe you know picking off of mergers, maybe even eating a, like a dry fly or something like that. You know, throwing on something that's a little bit less weight is always a good idea. So. All right, fly number three is the pine squirrel leech in brown or rust. Brown rust, uh, size 12. We had to put an attractor in. I mean, obviously, it's it's mid season. Uh, we're in, in the meat of December, but uh, you shouldn't disregard a good attractor fly like a leech or throwing an egg or maybe throwing a crane fly or something like that, uh, especially on the South Platte. Uh, Scott, where do you like, how do you like to rig? The, the uh, leech in your, like, your, if you're fishing three flies, where do you like to put it? You know, I will kind of move it around sometimes. There's a lot of times where mostly I'll use it as my lead fly or my point fly. Um, and it'll help get that fly down to the bottom quickest where my other one to two flies are going to be elevated just a little bit. And I'm a big fan of fishing that way during the winter months. So, um Having a lead fly like a leech, like an egg, uh, even tiny stones all seem to be things that I have on my rigs throughout the winter months. Um, but that leech uh, moves around good in the water, um, gets their attention. Sometimes they will key in on that and eat it. Other times it gets their attention. They'll be like, oh, there's a midge right behind that leech. Come over and eat it. And, but having a, a good point fly or lead fly is a good way to do it. Every now and then I'll put it on the bottom so it's getting down uh, first quickest into the water, um, down deep. But uh, most of the time I have it as my, my lead fly. Yeah. Tanner, do you, will you throw these on the free stones in the winter? Like we're, say, going to the Colorado, you like to throw those on the Colorado every once in a while? Yes, forget everything we just said about going smaller in the winter. Like, try something medium morsely, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it will get eaten. Just like you said, I mean, it's it's an attractor. I would rather catch fish, hook fish on that with 4X than be on 6X retying and yeah. having cold fingers. So, yeah, I mean, you got to search with big big attractor flies every time you're on the water. Of course, you'll know pretty quickly, you know, work it an hour. You don't get touched on it. Don't stick with it all day. You yeah. know, it's not a fly that's, like, suddenly probably going to turn on. It's either going to be on or off, and you'll know that right away. So, yeah, I mean, it's a great search fly. Have those eggs. Big leeches, even stoneflies on the free stones. I mean, have having a big pats on on the Colorado is never a bad thing to have on. So, because yeah. I mean, like what, like a stonefly has like a three, four year life cycle. Like those are going to be in the water no matter what time of year it is, right? They're always going to be there. And fish will have a memory for that, right? right. Three sixty five, and it's cold. They don't want to move a lot. They're uh, they're looking for something with a lot of protein, right? They're eating like me. They're eating like you. A little bit. Are you getting skinny in your tuna? <laughs> Wheat thins. Sell out. <laughs> All right, that's fly number three. <laughs> oh, let's get to the audience questions. Again, if you have any questions uh, for us in January, please leave them down in the comments below. Uh, we're going to touch on three quick questions here and then get back to the flies. Uh, the first one is from Dan Kochenek. Dan, I apologize if I messed up your last name. Uh, when fishing in, say, Cheeseman uh, in December, is it better to use a yarn or an airlock indicator? Uh, where do you guys fall on that? I like the yarn. Winter months, uh, low flows, doesn't make as big a splash in the water. 
uh, that are super sensitive. Um, windy days, I'll switch back over to airlock because sometimes those yarn ones act as a sail out there when you're trying to cast it out. They get pushed around, but uh, the yarn is very sensitive. It's very uh, uh, good at detecting strikes, and again, it doesn't splash around nearly as much. Yeah. So, do you uh, do you dress that just with like gink for the most part? Yep, yeah, any of the little crazy. dry fly float that I have on there, uh, I'll tease it out. Usually if I'm using yarn, uh, Velcro on my vest, sit there, tease it out a little bit, put the gink on it, and yeah, it floats pretty well. Yeah, Scott, noted vo- vest man. Vests, yeah. back. So they're back. They're back. back. In a big way? Yeah. For Scott, they are. Airlock? Yeah, yarn? I feel like I know this answer. Being a bobber. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's not with any advantages for sure. Um, everything he's just said about yarn makes total sense. <laughs> but I'll take I'll take the goose egg at Cheese McCannon in the winter time because I just don't really own yarn. So yeah, that's fair. But yes, yarn makes the most sense for sure. Right, I'm sort of in the same boat. It's more <laughs> right. of a laziness thing than anything else. It's like stick to what you know. I right. know my program. You know, like right. if I'm gonna have yarn on there, I'm just gonna want that to be a hopper. You know, right. 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 And if we went to Cheese Canyon tomorrow, Scott would catch like three to one fish. I'm gonna I mean, maybe I mean, even more. I'm so. not gonna say that's the yarn <laughs> indicator though. I think it's, that's just more the Scott thing. True. You Valid. Know, if we were both, if we were all three were to be fishing uh, airlocks or uh, thing with bobbers, I think Scott would still beat us. Pretty handily, I would imagine. Yeah. All right. Next question is from Landon Taylor. Uh, he wanted to sort of uh, pick our brains about um, general trend and what type of flies you switch to. Are dry flies totally out? Do fish tend to hit on larger flies or smaller flies? And what's the best way to approach fly selection when there is much flying bug activity? We sort of touched that on this a little bit in the first couple of flies. Um, you know, as a general rule, it's going to be smaller, starting small, but you, know, you can throw some bigger flies. Scott, when you're approaching the South Platte, you're not seeing any bugs flying around. What do you... What do you start with, and how do you move from that? Uh, generally, I start with small midges. And what I end up doing is I end up changing colors a lot, just seeing what I can do or put in front of them to get a strike. Um, the part of the question about dries, there's definitely still fish that are eating dries during the wintertime. I'm a huge fan of the Griffiths gnat. Um, it works out well as a dry fly during the, the winter months when you have some picky fish and you can't see what they're eating on the water. Um, going with the with the Griffiths gnat works out well, but um, midges, um, thinking about your tippet as well. Um, a lot of times you may get refusals if you're trying to trick those fish into eating small midge using 5X. So go down to that 6X um, and then, yeah, switch up size, switch up colors. Uh, a lot of times I'll even go smaller where I'll have a 22 on and it won't be getting eaten. So I'll go down to a 24 and see if that gets them. But again, back to kind of switching up the colors. They may be on red one day. They might be on black one day, um, even white. And just trying to uh, make the switch when you're on the water. Don't get stuck fishing one fly in a specific color. You can use the same fly, but just try try different variations of it and see if that is something that will um, just attract them, get their attention where they eat it. Yeah. Tanner, do you own a size 24 fly? No. Um, but based off that, I mean, the biggest thing for me is going to be, I'm, I'm changing my tippet size first. You know, if I'm starting with five X and I'm not getting touched, I'm going down to six X right away. And like he said, I mean, there is dry fly opportunities down at like your deckers, your tailwaters for sure. I am hunting for those, you know, um, and don't get stuck. Like I think a lot of people, you could probably agree in the winter, like everyone wants to just like beat up a hole with a nymphic and just camp in one hole all day. Um, if you do find a pot of risers in like one small flat slick, you stick a couple on a dry fly, like bounce around deckers or something like that and just look for that type of water you'll yeah. find. And then you could have a really good day just fishing dry flies, but you got to be hunting for that when, when you see it, you know. Um, but tip it for me first, and then, yeah, color is huge. You know, switch if they're not touching red, I'm not going to s- stick with red all day and force feed a fish. I'm going to try to find they're eating a black beauty. They're eating something else. So. Yeah. 
I think for me, the dry fly thing is like, if you're not looking, you're not, like you're missing a lot. Like there are certainly days like it'll be 12 degrees outside. It might be cloudy, and there's still there might be a dry. Like I've run into dry fly eaters on those days, right? And so like keeping your eyes open and looking for that stuff, I think that's that's like that's key if you want to if you don't want to throw if you don't want to you know put away the dry fly cast for the winter, right? Like like there's still a lot of opportunities to be had. You just have to sort of get out of your own get out of your own way and just uh, observe a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I defer to Scott when it comes to fly selection. Uh, sort of the same same sort of method methodology I would use. Uh, size, shape, color, weight, that sort of thing. And start as big as you can, and then move down uh, in size yeah. and profile as the day goes. Hopefully, the beginning of the day works out. You don't have to put on a size 24. You know? It's always nice when it works. Right. It's always nice when it works. All right, last question is from Scott Larson, and he's asking, uh, <laughs> what? Scott, we have chosen you. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I, did, I forgot to mention, I'll, uh, I'll be in the comments responding to uh, everyone whose question we asked here on the show. You guys get a, a trout surprise pack. Uh, and same thing goes, if your quest pet question is picked, in future episodes, I'll send you a trout surprise pack. So, uh, know that. that that's cool. There's like a hat. There's some other things. It's cool. It's nice. Uh, Scott Larson's asking: Is there a configuration for uh, three nymph rig set or three nymph setup that minimize, minimizes tangles and having to redo everything if you catch one fish? Um, basically, will you like? Is there a way to avoid the tangles in the winter? Like, could you have any one, hot tips for that? So one thing during the winter months that I tend to do more than how I fish in the summer months, I keep my nymphs a little bit tighter together. Um, I'm not using like 16 inches between my flies. A lot of times I'm making it a smaller rig, trying to get it or some of the flies in front of a fish without getting some of those little micro drifts that you can if you're using a longer setup. A lot of times if you get one, it's on the top, the middle, or the bottom, uh, you still might get a little bit of a tangle getting that fish in, getting it in the net. Um, but with the smaller rigs, I find it's a lot easier to get it out. A lot of times with those longer ones, that fish is going to sit there and wrap on it, spin, uh, do the death spirals in the net, and get everything all twisted and tangled up. Uh, smaller, tighter rigs tend to eliminate that a little bit. Right. You still get tangles, and tangles during the wintertime suck because you got cold hands. You can get wet hands handling, uh, getting a fish out of the net. and But the uh, the tighter rigs tend you to like work 12 for me. inches, 10, 12 inches? Yeah, 10 to 12. Yeah. One thing that I've seen Scott do that I think is a uh, useful tip, and I've I've incorporated into my, uh, when I spend time on the water in the winter, is you have a little, little like, cloth, a little dish cloth, little, like, microfiber cloth that you wipe your hands dry with, which blew my mind. I'm, I'm so stupid. I didn't realize that was a good idea. I had been fishing for 20-some years without bringing a towel out with me and saw somebody with a hand towel, and I was like, oh, dry hands. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Keep your hands warm. Because wet hands in the cold is miserable, but dry hands in the cold, it's much more tolerable. Right? Yeah, it's, cold hands are never fun, but it does make it a little bit more tolerable. Yeah. So for if, sure. you have a, if you have a dry hand, it's a lot easier to get something untangled as well. Exactly, um, yeah. And so you run into less of that frustration. Tanner, do you have any uh, hot tips for remaining untangled? I would say, I mean, it's it's going to be unavoidable. I think the majority of those tangles, my guess would be like if the fish eats your top fly and it's like, it always happens like when you're about to go for the net and the fish is like flopping around. Like right. try to keep that fish lower, like in the water when you're scooping it, you know, like don't get it up because once it's up and it's flip flopping around, like yeah. you're toast, you know. Um, if you can net it with while it's still riding in the water, you know, you get like a clean net, a clean scoop and like keep the fish in the net. With, with the water um if you've seen any of my videos like you know i have like this net bag that's like 87 feet deep right. Um, rising. right yes boom um because i think i think that honestly does help because i mean the fish is in the water the whole time um and he's not flopping around nearly as much and another thing is take advantage of having multiple nymph rigs set up you know i think right. a lot of people in the winter time because you are going to be fighting cold hands take advantage of like the orvis box that you can Dropper, the yeah, dropper the dropper box. box or like the rigging foam, something like that. Because yeah, if you're tangled, 
and like you're gonna spend 10 hours to untangle and probably have to retie anyways like just clip it off and you have unroll your rig and you have another rig ready to go boom right. you know so one knot is better than big brain stuff from one the knot team is man, you know? better than that was a great tip right there it's better so than i might have to start knots, doing that so, so. Yeah. if i can teach scout something like oh, dang. That, that's a victory I, for me like, i like that that's cool. i like that idea Market a lot yeah, so cool all right uh that's the question and answer portion uh, again leave comments down below if you have any questions for next month uh, and we will get a trout surprise back out to you so let's get back to the flies fly number four is the no mercy midge from Philiwani. tanner what do you like about that fly you were no you were noting it in the shop yeah i mean that's a I mean, that's a winter classic i think uh, especially down in your technical tailwaters Philawani spends time on those waters, so he will create flies that work. Uh, I think we were fishing last year with, like, Russell, Russell Miller before, like, this fly came out. Maybe yeah. it was, like, four years ago where time goes, you know? Um, and it was like, dang, this fly is sweet. It's uh, it's like a mole fly on steroids. It's got, like, kind of that UV body that makes it stick out. It's going to be great if you want to, you know, fit, you see some of those dry fly eaters. You can fish that as, like, a trailer off yeah. that, and it'll ride in the film. You could fish it with weight on a three-fly nymph rig. It's very versatile. It's... Yeah. It's a very productive fly for sure. Um, swing it out. Yeah, the thing hammers fish. CDC puff. Yeah. CDC just has all that movement. It's hard to beat. Movement. Right. Uh, and little trigger points, right? Right. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you like fishing flies with CDC in the wintertime? Like, what, what, what's your... I do. I like fishing flies with CDC yeah. year-round. Yeah. So I, I tie, like, my RS2s, a lot of my midges, a lot of stuff with CDC. I just... Uh, yeah. It works out well. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Cool. There we go. That's fly number four. The No Mercy Mitch. Mm-hmm. Fly number five is Matt McCandle's Massacre Midge. Uh, this is in brown. <clears throat> uh, it's got a little foam on it. Scott, talk to me about uh, how you like to fish a fly like the Massacre Midge. Um, I like having it as my very bottom fly a lot of times, especially if uh, fish have either been suspended or a little bit more up off the bottom. Whereas the uh, the two bit midge gets it right down onto the bottom, right in the fish's face. When they're up a little bit, having that with a little foam back on it um, just helps it keep it suspended in the water a little bit more. Yeah. And you can fish it a little bit different than some of the others. You can have that leech as your lead where it's getting it down, but that massacre midge at the back will be just trailing up above it a bit, won't be down on the bottom like the other ones. And uh, if you find those fish that are a little bit suspended, that can be the can be the ticket sometimes. Yeah. Sort of uh, foam back emergery, yeah. That's yeah. also a fly that works. That is. They do work. This fly <coughs> also works. Tanner, have you ever fished this on the Paco? No. <laughs> have you ever fished this on the South Platte? Um. Yeah. I mean, I fished that fly quite a bit throughout those. Just like I mean, Scott said, it just makes so much sense if you see fish up and active on those winter days where it does get warmer it's you know, it's a great fly because it'll be it won't be just clinking bottom you know it's it's going to be suspended and those fish will the fish will move to it and pick it up for sure so cool nice well there we go that's five flies for december big thanks to scott for making the trip down to the new studio tanner thanks for making the trip trip across the street you're welcome <laughs> glad to be here there we go there we go nice. <laughs> appreciate you guys tuning in uh look forward to seeing you guys for the ep- uh, next episode of five flies in january uh we have rock mountain fall coming out soon we have a shoot with uh, scott coming up a little on the water stuff maybe some tips and tricks uh and then uh reading water with russ which might have the most comedic uh like 30 seconds of fly fishing film that i've ever been a part of yeah, if that can be unedited, like it is pure gold for sure. Casting light flies, uh, oh, f*** me. This isn't my favorite place to start. F***ing god tree. It's way the f*** up there too. Uh, and they're f***ing rising again. Look, we all get frustrated at times. Trees right. are a known enemy for us <laughs> anglers, and uh, I think it's the most relatable thing I've ever seen. So that's a little teaser for all you guys who've made it to the end of the video. Stay tuned to the YouTube channel. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys 
Come here, De- Trout's Denver. See up, see us up in Trout's Frisco. Like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one.